Um, Psalm 34, verse 8, if you have that, and you're, if you have the New King James Version of the Bible, then read it out loud with me. All right? Ready? Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. So, so God being a good God is uh, one of the primary emphases I want to put out in this series. That when we're talking about the real God, we need to understand the way that he is. So we don't believe something about him that's untrue. And it is a significant problem if we believe some major things about God that are not accurate, all right? And him being good is one of those major you know, statements that is repeated again and again throughout the word of God. But I want us to be real clear in what we mean by saying that God is good. And the best way, the best synonym I can think of is good. <laughs> what I mean by that is good really does mean good. It doesn't take on a different definition once we enter into a church building. All right. Uh, I don't know if that makes sense to some, but I think in, in when people couch uh, Bible terms in religion, they often mean something completely different. And I don't think we're supposed to do that. Especially we're not supposed to do that, that with the Lord. It doesn't mean that we have bad or evil things and then we kind of say, yeah, but in a manner of speaking, it's good. We, you know, we put the mysterious ways banner over it and, and call evil things good because we just can't understand. No, we really can. We can understand what's good and bad. I mean, right? If I come punch you in the nose, are you going to call that good? No, that's bad, no matter if you're a Christian or not. Right? No matter if you prayed this morning or not, that's still bad. That wasn't love. That wasn't kind. That, that was, uh, that, that, that's a bad thing. And so we don't want to uh, uh, call good things evil or dismiss, or what we do want to do is dismiss evil events as being from the Lord. All right? And it's one of the ways that we really get clarity in life, okay? Because not everything that's happened in my life has been good. Now, I haven't experienced all, you know, beds of roses and so forth throughout life. No, some things have been evil. So what do I do with that? How do you reconcile that? I say, that was not God. Amen. That wasn't his will, wasn't his plan, it wasn't his desire. There are other things at work in this fallen world besides God. That wasn't God right there. That's how, that's, and then I think we're supposed to do that. We're supposed to be super clear and understand what he wants, what he doesn't want. In fact, a, a popular, becoming more popular because of our crazy culture these days is the verse in Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20, which reads, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. All right? So you can see that that's happening in our world today. What's the word to them? Woe. <laughs> Yeah. So if you see that happening, use it. Say, whoa. Yeah. Whoa. Or uh, some translations say, how horrible. Or others say, how terrible. There's even a couple I read that say, doom to those. <laughs> doom to those who do what? Who call evil good and good evil. We, as if you're a believer now, if you're a Christian, you should be able to, this should be our goal, is to call things what they are, all right? Not just my opinion, but I want to narrow my thinking down to understand what really is, not just what I have made to be real or good or evil. Um, this this uh, passage is often used, and more so in these last days, and I think this is a good thing, I'm in agreement with it, but it's used to denounce uh, sinful behavior, uh, denounce calling sinful behavior as something we should celebrate, something we should embrace, 
something that's, that everyone should just have respect for. And, and, and I, I, again, I agree with that usage. You know, when people call righteousness hate, if you have a standard of righteousness that's founded in the word of God and people say you're a hater because you believe that, see, that's wrong. I'm not going to be intimidated by that because why do I give my mind over to confusion? Amen. Why would I give my mind over to blurring the, you know, the, the blurring of genders and everything that's going on in our world? I'm not going to enter into that. I'm just going to lovingly with, you know, high standards and yet forgiveness and love say what things are. Right? I'm not going to blur this because if I do, woe to me. Right? Woe. So I'm not going to enter into that. Uh, but at the same time, now I see this calling evil good and good evil as going beyond moral behavior and that type of thing. It even can go to what people experience they, that they attribute to God. And if they experience something evil but think, well, this is of the Lord, then they're calling evil good. Simple things like, like sickness and disease would be an example, okay? Some, now, now watch, in, leave the church building, it's evil. Yeah. <laughs> they, they put up structures all over all the cities, usually several stories, to combat sickness and disease. And there, people give their lives to studying medicine and so forth. And why? Because they all know it's bad. It hurts people and it's evil. But sometimes people come into the church and they go, well, God works in mysterious ways. And all of a sudden there's this twisting and there's this blending and confusion of, of good and evil. And sometimes it's good. I say we just leave it what it is and say it's evil. Say, so, well, what about the Bible? That's where we're getting this. For example, Psalm 41.8 writes, an evil disease, they say, clings to him, and now that he lies down, he will rise up no more. Well, what kind of disease? Evil, evil disease. We shouldn't even need a scripture, <laughs> but we have one. Thank you, thank you, Lord, for that. Uh, Acts 10.38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit with fire, who went about doing good and healing all who were, what? Oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. So sickness and disease is oppression of the devil, right? So never is it a blessing in disguise. Never is it the work of God. It, no, it is, it is oppression by the devil. I'm going to say that when I'm in the church building. I'm going to say that when I'm outside the church building. It just is what it is. All right. So it's e evil. Even, even death. Sometimes I think people get that confused. Is death good or bad? Well, I can tell you from Scripture, it says that uh, in, uh, in uh, what's the next, next one I have? 1 Corinthians 15, 26, the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. So, so in the Word of God, death is referred to as an, an enemy. Now, if you've lost someone, you know, had someone close to you pass away, you see that. Or if it's trying to take you out, you see that. That's something that's not for me. It's against me. It's trying to end me, not, not extend my life. It, it is an enemy. Say, so, well, what about that, that, that verse that says that precious in the sight of the Lord are the death of his saints? Well, you have to see that from, that's in the Psalms, but you can look it up yourself. But you have to see that when people die, when the, when, when the Lord's people die, uh, in a sense, that's precious to him because, uh, you know, he's merciful, he's compassionate, he's receiving, he's welcoming. I mean, that's going to be in one sense a glorious day for us, Amen. right? Some believe that's even just, talk, that's talking about people who are martyred for his name, that that's, that's precious in, in that regard. But take that, set that aside, death by itself is not something that brings God pleasure. It is an attack against his prized creation. And, and, and we can say this to such a degree that it's not only righteous people that death is an enemy to. The, the scriptures tell us that God does not take pleasure even in, when the unrighteous die. Okay? And that might, might, seem, might be news to some. Well, the Lord, you know that when that bad person dies, isn't that kind of a good thing? I mean, we, <laughs> I say that because like when we watch movies, you ever watch movies when there's someone that's really bad? And at the end, that person who's really bad dies a gruesome death. 
and we're all, we feel bad about it, but kind of we're like, yes. <laughs> Get them. No, that's not, the, that's not the way the Lord feels. That's that flesh, that's that revenge, that get them back in us. Uh, but God does not take delight when bad people die. Okay, I'm not, again, I'm not making this up. Here's one example. There are others. Ezekiel 33, 11, say to them, as I live, says the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way uh, and, and live, turn, turn from your evil way for why should you die, O house of Israel? So you see that when someone's wicked, God's not rooting for their demise. What is he rooting for? Their return. He's rooting for them to turn around. If you are against the Lord or running from God or in opposition to all we're doing here and everything today, God is not rooting for you to be destroyed. <laughs> He's, and neither are we, by the way. Right? Yeah. Right, 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 right. Okay. <laughs> we're not seeking someone to pay for what they've done, to suffer for their sin. God's desire is not that people have to suffer for their sin, but that they... Turn. See, justice is still pure. Amen. Justice is still real. That's why he's not going to become dishonest or unjust. His, he's rooting for people to not get what they deserve because they turn away from yeah. what they did wrong. And they turn to him. Amen. Yeah. Amen. So I say all this so I can reemphasize and we get well ingrained with this reality of God's heart for people. And if we see him as against us or rooting for bad things or causing bad things, it's just not who he is. Even when people totally deserve it. I mean, I deserve some slapping around sometimes, right? Reality is biblically hell. It's what I deserve. So, you know, when people say, oh, something good happens and they say, oh, you deserve it. No, I don't really but I'll take grace, I'll take forgiveness, I'll take the gift of God. And that's the correct thinking, but God wants people to get off. He wants people to be forgiven, for them to experience mercy. And I want you to think about the Lord this way, okay? Whenever we are commanded or told to act a certain way, we know that he is not the opposite of that. All right, New Testament commandment. Remember, everything's wrapped up in one commandment. Anybody know what that is? It's love. There is a new, a new commandment that we love one another, right? That's, that's the New Testament commandment. Are we told to love people? We know what's involved in that. That's forgiveness and kindness and generosity and so forth. Uh, we, we are told to love people, but yet does God hold a grudge? You forgive them, but I'm going to be up here... We're going to be, we're told be sweet and kind and gentle with people, but God's going to be harsh, but he's going to be unforgiving. He's going to hold a grudge. No. All right. Some of you aren't sure about that one, or at least not excited. But uh, if you would find with me the book of Luke, I'll give you, give you an example. Luke chapter, uh, chapter nine. Luke chapter 9, there was an, a, something that happened with Jesus and his disciples, I think, is revealing. In verse 51, so Luke 9, 51, now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up that he steadfastly sent his face to go to Jerusalem. Where's he going? Jerusalem. Why Jerusalem? Well, that's where the this, that's where the feasts would happen. That's where the different celebrations uh, uh, would take place. Jerusalem was the hub. It was the, the place, all right? And so he sent, mess and sent messengers before his face. And as they went, they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. Now, if you know anything about the Jews and the Samaritans, they weren't chummy. They weren't close. They had lots of disagreements about... Uh, theological disagreements. You might remember when Jesus met the woman at the well in John chapter 4, she started saying, you Jews say that Jerusalem's the place you ought to worship, and we say over here, and, and that's when he's taught about worshiping in spirit and truth. They had a lot of disagreements, and they didn't want to associate with each other. 
So Jesus, his disciples going before him and him coming through them on their way to do Jew stuff, Jerusalem stuff, they don't want anything to do with them. So you understand this. I mean, James and John were kind of ticked off about that. It's like, how dare you dishonor the Lord? How, you dis, how dare you dishonor Jesus? Don't you know who he is? And so they weren't happy. They're defending, they think, they're defending the Lord. And uh, uh, let's see. Well, verse uh, 53. But they did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. The Samaritans didn't receive him. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them as Elijah did? Now, in the moment, you can see they're a little bit annoyed. And by the way, just as James and John, you ever seen those people that try to make John out to be like this effeminate dude because he leaned on Jesus? This is John also. Let's burn him up, Lord. <laughs> Religion paints a false picture and culture tries to change the scriptures and all this kind of stuff. So anyway, just so you know, John, like, he had a really good idea here. Let's burn people. <laughs> they reject you. Let's burn them up. But he turned and re he did what? He rebuked them. Jesus didn't say, you guys, that's a great idea. Why didn't I think of that? I mean, I'm a word guy. I should have just said... Let's do the fire thing. <laughs> he rebuked them. All right. Did Jesus ever rebuke people? This is one example. He rebuked uh, Peter when he was speaking by the wrong spirit. So he was super nice and comforting and forgiving. And also, when people were yielding to the wrong spirit, no. He, he'd get pretty serious with them. Okay. He rebuked them. Uh, let's see and said, you do not know what manner of spirit you are of, for the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. So again, I want you to see the heart of, or the, heart of the Lord here. He didn't want them to pay for what they did. He didn't want to get them back. You guys are mean to us. You guys are unreceiving. We'll show you. No, he said, that's not what I came here to do. I came here to save people, right? In John 3, it says, Jesus didn't come to condemn the world, but to save them. He wasn't there to point out uh, the fact they're doing wrong. He said, let's just go to the next town. We can stay with them. We'll, we'll leave them alone. Don't you want to get them, Lord? No, I really want rather them turn. I would rather them be forgiven. I would rather show mercy and kindness. This is the heart of God. Does it, does, I don't know, does this give you comfort at all? Yes. Man, it does with me. If you don't ever make any mistakes, you're probably okay. But if you ever do something wrong and you think, oh, the Lord is totally ticked off with me right now. I tell you, his heart for you, not that you continue in wrongdoing, but his heart for you is not, I want to get you. Come on. I want to slap you. No, he says, I, I, I want to show you mercy. Come on. I want to show you my love. He really is that way. And that's amazing. I mean, you know how like when you're really good, when you're really, you've done all the work and someone else who didn't put in the work, they come, you want to, well, you want to almost look down on them. It's like, well, you didn't do what I did. God is perfect. And, and look at us. And he's still not wanting us to get what we, what we got coming to us. Okay. So Jesus was revealing the heart of God. The manner of spirit they were of was get them. He said, that's not who we are. It's not what we came to do. The manner of spirit we should follow is that of love. Yeah. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10 reads, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to, to the nice people. Let us do, do good to those who deserve it. Let us do good to those who are good to us. Is that what it says? Let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. So that means, yeah, there is a priority here when we treat each other and we do good for each other. But he said, let us do good for everybody. Well, they don't deserve it. No, but neither do we. Let us do good to all. But here's my question. Are we to do good to all 
but God, the one we were supposed to imitate. Ephesians 5.1 says, be imitators of God as your children. We're to do good to all, but he does evil to some. Come on. See, that's not logical. Right. Imitate me, and yet he's evil towards some and good towards others. So no. Good. There's a scripture in, in, the, in 1 Corinthians that often gets uh, twisted and, and misinterpreted. It's 1 Corinthians 10.13. And uh, it's important for us to know what God's doing and what what he's not doing. It it, it reads, no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to to bear it. Have you ever heard this this passage uh, stated like this? You know, the Bible says God will never put on you more than you can handle. God won't give you more than you can handle. Listen, this passage said nothing about God putting anything on anybody. He's not the one putting stuff on us. <laughs> He's just not responsible for that. All right? What it is saying, well, multiple things, but when, when temptation comes, and temptation can also be translated test and trial and these things. When these things come to us, uh, he said, what's coming your way? It's common to man. In other words, uh, the devil has no new bag of tricks. <laughs> he has no new strategies. The thing you're dealing with, you know what? Lots of other people are too. How many know one of the beliefs, one of the crippling beliefs is where we're dealing with something hard and difficult is that I'm the only one. I'm the only one to deal with this. No one else can even uh, relate to me whatsoever. I, I don't, when I used to do counseling, sometimes people would have some horrific stories of things that happened and even some things that they did. And sometimes we're waiting for me to be shocked because they thought for sure this was the first time he had ever heard of someone doing something like this. And uh, I imagine there was a first time hearing some things, but uh, from memory's sake, it was like, no, I've heard some things that were actually worse than that. <laughs> and uh, what you've experienced, you know, lots of people have, and what you've done, lots of other people have done that too. All right? I don't know if that helps, but it should bring some degree of comfort that when others have done this or had this or this happened to them and they've made it, They've survived. Sometimes it brings comfort, like I can make it too. You know, if you went to a doctor and they said, you know, we've tested you and, and you're the first person on record in the world, in history, <laughs> to ever have this. You go, oh. <laughs> you mean there's not a pill? <laughs> you mean there's not an easy, no, it's like, we don't know what to do. Oh, that does, see, that doesn't give you comfort, right? But if they say, oh yeah, like 80% of people have had this at some point and, uh, you know, then we're like, oh, okay, whew, good. <laughs> yeah. And, and likewise, with the trouble and challenges that we have, they're common. They're common. The enemy wants to believe you're the only one and you're stuck forever. But they're just regular old stuff. He's been doing this, he meaning the, the, the dirt bag, the devil, from, from the beginning. And here's God's part. Remember, he's a good God. We're defining the character, the nature, the, the, who he really is. What he does is he makes a way of escape. He doesn't bring the problem, but he does bring the escape. In other words, if something is beyond our ability to resist, to overcome, to get victory in, he won't even permit it to happen. But when the temptation comes, the common demand temp- temptation, there's always a way out. If you say today, I've got some problems and I've checked for doors, there is no way out. You know, like the escape room. Like, there's no way, I'm, this, there's no way out of this. There absolutely is. 100% there is. And God is faithful to create that route out of the situation for you. Amen. That's why we trust in his faithfulness to provide us a way out. He's good to us. Say, well, I put myself in this spot. And he's still merciful. And he still wants to show us kindness. He absolutely does. Because that's who he is. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let me have you turn to one more place today. And uh, and that's Genesis uh, chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. I say turn there, but I did put it up on the screen as well. So you might as well do both. This way you can highlight and look at it for yourself. 
See, circumstances correctly seen never indict God as being anything but good and just. So if what I've seen or what I've been through or what I'm in the middle of now makes me think that God is somehow against me or he's not helping me or he's not answering, he's, I am misreading that situation. Okay, If he is accused, if he is indicted, then I'm misreading because he is good, period. So, Lord, give me better sight. Give me discernment. Help me to understand the circumstance and see your way of escape. I must keep God righteous because he is, but I must keep him that way in my own mind. See, there are a lot of people that don't serve God today. Because something happened that they don't understand. And in their, in their lack of understanding, God gets blamed. But oftentimes it's the church's fault too because we haven't done a good job of explaining how these things work. And so they think God's running everything. In fact, you hear that in a lot of churches today. It's the God is in control message. And it's like it's everything that God is, that has ever happened is somehow a part of his grand design. It's called, ex, you know, called extreme Calvinism or whatever it is. Uh, read my, one, my book, Authorized, to get the counter to that. But, uh, uh, but, but those, those beliefs, you have to be upset with God. Because <laughs> everything that happened, every rape, every murder, every child screaming in agony in, in, with some disease, all controlled by God. Or it's not. And I say 100% it's not. Yeah. It's opposite of him. He doesn't want any of it to happen. He's not responsible and shouldn't, shouldn't be blamed. If, again, we go all the way back to Genesis. This is the temptation uh, to eat of the tree that they were told not to. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God said, now the serpent, that's the devil talking through this serpent. You, you understand that. Has God indeed said, see, this is the same way he comes at us today. Question the word of God. Question what God has said. Uh, if he can undermine the word of God in our lives, that's our first step towards failure. Has God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the garden, of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Again, this is Satan's strategy. By the way, it hasn't changed. Common to man. Satan's strategy is, he's just going to flat up say, did God really say that? Yeah, well, he did say this. And he said, well, that's not true. He said, you're going to die. No, you're not going to die. And when we hear that, where we have those thoughts, that's when we know the source of this is trying to undermine God in my life. Verse 5, for God knows, and that's key right there. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. So there's lots of truths in here and, and so forth. And husband, why don't you speak up? And Yeah, anyway. <laughs> lots, of things, lots, of, lots of things going on there. But I want you to see Satan's strategy, what he's doing here. He's undermining who God is. He's saying, yeah, you don't really know what he said. And then he's not really telling the truth. He's lying to you. And his motive is he knows things and he doesn't want you to know them. What's the, what's the subtlety here? God is withholding good things from you. There is information and knowledge and experience that you need, that you want, you would so enjoy. And God knows that. So he doesn't want you to have it. He wants to keep you down. He wants to keep you, your life, you know, small and pathetic. And, and, and that's why he told you not to do things. Come on. Is there ever a lie associated with a commandment to avoid certain things? Or is it stay away from this? Don't do this. Um, is the entire narrative that because it'll destroy you? 
Now, if you're reading the word, you see that and you know that, that, that it's built into that. But the belief is, no, that's a really good thing. It's not going to hurt me. It's not bad for me. But it's just not allowed. You know, and illogical. In other words, God's keeping stuff from us. It's a belief that undermines his goodness. See, Satan didn't mention here all the thousands of trees that they were allowed to eat. This vast abundance, this playground of trees and, and wonderful life got them to, you know, it's like you guys are the, the, the Garden of Eden in all its abundance. Then there's this one little tree over here, tree of knowledge of good and evil. He wants to get people to turn their back get out of focus everything that God has given, all the blessings, and just focus on the one thing he said no to till that's all you can see. You forgot about all the blessings. All you can see is this thing I can't have. It's like what people do to their, their spouse sometimes. They, their spouse has amazing traits, lots of amazing traits to them. They do so many good things, yet they get dialed in on the one or two things that just annoy them all day long. And they bug them, why don't they do this? Or why don't they quit doing this? And, and that, that trap is to forget about all the good stuff and just see the negative. Let I me mean, know your marriage is on the rocks when you do that. Well, say, what's the answer? Uh, it's, th it's this. Yeah. Come on. Come on. Yeah. yeah. And if we start focusing, now it's true in marriage, it's true in life, it's, it, it's true in, in walking with God. Get your eyes on his goodness, not just on, well, the Lord won't let me do this. The Lord said no to this. Huh? Get your eyes on the blessings of God and it'll keep things in perspective. But this is the strategy, all right? I say it this way, the strategy from Satan, get them to believe that God is holding back the good stuff from them. Get them to believe that. God is holding back on you, the good things in life. And here, here's, here's the lie. If you fully commit your whole life to God and live in obedience to his word, you will be miserable and miss out on all the fun. Listen, this, it's almost, when you say it like this, it's almost silly. How many people are falling for this every day? They don't have, they got things to do that are fun or productive. They don't have time to do church. They don't have time to serve. They don't have time. I mean, they got, they work hard for their money. I'm not going to give a tenth of that away. Right? People believe that their life is actually better when they are focused on what they have determined is worth their time, worth their energy, worth their money. And if it's contrary to the word of God, it's a lie. But they've been convinced of something that God wants you. And usually they won't say God because people want to say, yeah, God's with me on the lake <laughs> and on the mountain. And uh, they won't say God, but they'll usually say, well, it's the church because church is, you know, controlled by people. The church wants your money. The church just wants to, you know, take all of your time and control your life. And, and, and there probably have been people out there that have done that. But that's the lie that people buy into and then it gets attributed to God. And, and it's how Satan wins. Hallelujah. I want to say the opposite. I want to say, if you give your life fully, completely, 100% to the Lord, and do everything that you know to do that is of him. By the way, he's not a hard taskmaster. Not just driving you into the ground. He won't let me have ice cream. Yes, he will. Uh, uh, but if you, I'm telling you, if you, you sell out the whole route and give everything, then your life is going up from there because you're stepping into the goodness of God. You're stepping away from what's wrong and evil. They fell for this lie, Adam and Eve did. Did their lives get better from then on, from there forward? No, no. They got to experience the beginnings 
of heartache and pain and suffering because they believed that God was holding out on them. Bought into the lie that he was not good in some way. There are people today that believe that heaven is a place where we're going to be bored. <laughs> that it's dull. They think, they entertain the notion, well, what are we even going to do there? And so their absence of knowledge, you know, sitting on a, on a cloud, playing a harp. <laughs> Boring. Or it's, you know, or something that's just not true. And they entertain that thing. I don't even know if I want that. And then, then add this second lie to it. Hell is where the party is. You know people say that. Man, what a sad lie. How many know there's, no, there's not a party? There is zero, not for a, a millisecond, party in hell. Heaven is described, well, the psalmist said, in his presence is fullness of joy. And at his right hand are pleasures forever. I tell you, this is the, this is the God we serve. I'm going to be with him forever, and I'm not going to have one millisecond of a sad moment. <laughs> Full joy. And what else? Well, God doesn't want people to have pleasure. That's why he says, don't do that and don't do that. <laughs> At his right hand, pleasures forever. And hell is defined in, in the word of God as a place of torment. Forever. Torment versus pleasure. That's why it's not the Lord's will that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. He's rooting for everybody, even those who have done wrong, even those who have done. Remember on the cross, Jesus said, Lord, get them. Oh, no, no, no. That wasn't what he said. He said, Lord, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And they were the ones that put the nails in his hands. And he said, Lord, forgive them. Did he mean it? Yes. You're in agony. You're in pain. Brutal. Forgive them. That's the way our, our that's the true God. Amen. That's the Lord we serve. Amen. Man, he's nice beyond niceness can ever be. <laughs> he's, if you know a nice person, he's so much more and forgiving, and he doesn't want anyone to go to hell. He doesn't want anyone to suffer. That's not his design at all. He wants to show them goodness all their days. Amen. Let's pray today. Father, thank you for showing us your, your, your mercy, your love, showing us who you are.